Uh, hello, my name is Matthew, and this is Andy, and I just read The Adventure of the Lion's Mane uh, by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, and this is a part of my read-along series and book club with Steve Donahue. We're reading Murder Mysteries in the month of March, and we're reading all of the Sherlock Holmes short stories. And The Adventure of the Lion's Mane, uh, again, experiments with um, viewpoint, how the story is being told, and who is telling the story. And this is one of the rare examples, I believe it's the second time we've had um, a story written by the hand of Sherlock. Uh, there's one other story that I remember where Watson was writing it, but it was, an, it, it was, a, it was a short story it was a case that uh, Watson was writing where it's entirely Sherlock uh, telling a story at a time that Watson wasn't around. But uh, other than that, one, we have two other stories where, where Sherlock was actually writing them. And the, the first one that I came across, I don't remember the name of it now, but I found it strange and kind of um, unnecessary. It, it seemed like um, it didn't need to be written by Sherlock. Um, this one has a much better um, explanation, even though it's slightly inconsistent. We have a retired Sherlock Holmes, and he's on the coast of England somewhere where he's uh, reading his books, uh, living a retired life, uh, doing his beekeeping, uh, being interested in agriculture, and no longer has um, a direct, uh, consistent, continual correspondence uh, with Watson. Watson is living his own life, which uh, off and on has been a fairly reliable modern, um, reliable model for these stories. They both live separate lives and then come together uh, with... Um, intense, adventurous, memorable moments that are worth recording. The slightly inconsistent part, um, which for all the times that um, Watson and Sherlock talk about the stories that Watson writes, um, Sherlock belittles them, doesn't really like them, um, kind of allows him uh, to write these stories. Uh, so, to have a story that uh, Sherlock feels um, is important enough to write, and the reason that he's writing it is because uh, Watson just isn't around anymore, that's a really great idea. And then you read the story and think, well, how strange. How, this doesn't seem um, exactly like the story that Sherlock would write, but that can be allowable. The next strange thing... Um, is even though Doyle is incredibly versatile in putting a, a voice in a character where with um, all, all the description, the detail of um, clothing and manner um, and personality and behavior, you really get a sense that uh, each time someone's talking, they feel um, like an individual that, ha that has their own voice. And we, we've read Watson's version of Sherlock, his idealized version of um, Sherlock, very much like uh, Plato's version of Socrates. And so either something is very off and, and wrong uh, in the writing style of Sherlock, or we it really shows uh, that idealization that uh, Watson was putting on his characterization of of Sherlock. I hope I hope that made some sense. So my point is, um, in a story where he's living in this little little town, uh, quiet life, people shuffle around, everyone knows one another. Um, as he's writing this, you could imagine that each time uh, a character is introduced, 
you would just get a whole page describing every detail. Someone's walking down the street, and um, Sherlock, as he's writing this, could tell you the, the whole life of a person. And instead, it does read as if Sherlock is uh, pretty much a casual observer of the world. And, and instead of the person that we know that counts the steps... <laughs> He, he observes. He doesn't just see. He observes. That, that um, is not translated um, in the writing of Sherlock in, in the story. The idea that Sherlock is writing the story. And then uh, one other aspect that's kind of a general thought of um, the story that we haven't gotten to yet. Uh, the Lion's Mane. The adventure of the Lion's Mane. It's hardly an adventure. Um comes down to um, the, the, the format of Sherlock and Watson in an apartment with the person bursting in the room. It's, um, it's recurring. It's, it's just a, um, a structure that uh, pretty much the majority of these stories have. One of the reasons that it seems to be so reliable, so consistently used is that it works so well and it makes so much sense. Um, it's, it's a detective office of sorts. Sherlock is uh, famous, and so it's a magnet for people looking for help. They're having uh, these tremendous, uh, spectacular, worrying, criminal um, episodes in their lives, and they run flocking to the door of Sherlock. Anytime you have the detective going off somewhere and just bumping into amazing, um, <laughs> these uh, ridiculous, larger-than-life uh, criminal escapades, um, it, it, it starts making it feel, making the storytelling feel uh, false. A as if... Um, if, if uh, Sherlock went on a world tour, there would just be this uh, trail of mayhem and murder and zany criminal behavior following him wherever he goes. Um, now, all of that being said, this story and a lot of the stories that I've been reading recently, uh, the, the most, the, we're getting towards the end of this uh, reading series. So we're in the 1900s now, and it's become more and more apparent that these stories really do feel like they're being written in a different time period. Um, so this is a story where Sherlock is um, living a quiet life near the coast of England somewhere. Um, him and a friend or him, him and an acquaintance are walking down the beach. Um, they see a man staggering over and then... He falls over and he's dead. They, um, Sherlock and his friend, they run over. Uh, he has a Burberry coat. The the person that dies is wearing a Burberry. Um, over his shoulders, he doesn't have his arms through the sleeves. And they pull the coat off and he has like whip whipping marks down his back. And, um, okay, he's not quite dead yet. He, ha he has his last dying his last dying words, and he, he says something along the lines of the lion's mane, the lion's mane. And they're on this coast. They can look all the way down one side, all the way down the other side. They can see the uh, footprints around. The guy has only been on the beach for 15 minutes. Um, it's fairly abandoned. Another person comes over that had a storied past with the uh, recently deceased, comes over with alarm, uh, comes up behind Sherlock and his acquaintance. And uh, the, the description of the death, I wish I would have thought about uh, having it <laughs> ready to go. Uh, oh gosh, now I'm going to kick myself. Um, the description of the person that died was much more detailed. Uh, it's, it's gruesome and gory and, oh 
gosh, I wish I could find it. Um, grotesque in, in a way that so many of the other um, stories that I've been reading, uh, when there is a murder, there's a, a crime, it's slightly romanticized. Not in this one. Um, you, you just you get a description of the whole dead body, a, a portrait of a dead man that died a horrific death. So it's there's no rose-colored lenses. It's not uh, skipping over the seriousness of a crime to get onto the fun detection part. Um, it's um, it makes you feel or could could make you feel queasy. Um, just um, having an unblinking eye describing um, a horrific death. Then, at this point, the story goes on. We hear about all of these characters. Um, there's uh, a, a moment where someone is told in their past they had thrown a dog, they picked up someone else's dog and thrown it through a plate glass window. Very much uh, similar to the, the scene in The Idiot. Um, but my point is, uh, we start getting a series of red herrings. Sherlock goes completely on the alert. The local inspector comes over, uh, is relieved to see Sherlock and says, can you help? Um, I, I very much appreciate your help. This is way over my head. And we start getting the clues and backstories of the characters. Um, and it's just a series of red herrings. Um, we, we learn a little bit about a, a, a beautiful woman. We learn a little bit about um, a bad relationship that this person had in the past. We learn a little bit about uh, someone trying to run away somewhere. Um, and it goes on and on and on. It is interesting in some respects, to see um, the interior life of Sherlock's um, deduct deductive mechanisms. So the things spinning around his head and um, from his perspective, what he's looking for, what's important, and um, again, comparing it to how Watson would um, be describing these scenes uh, does feel much more realistic. Um, it's not one of those situations where at the very beginning, um, Sherlock is thinking to himself, oh, aha, I know how all of this gets solved. Um, instead, he doesn't know. He, he has to do detective work and look, look, look around for clues and things aren't making sense. Um, very much the way that um, Watson's looking around and seeing a bunch of stuff and it's not really adding up. Um, of course, Sherlock does solve it, but it's um, some impossible thing happens, an unexplainable death, a whole series of red herrings, and then an explanation that essentially had nothing to do with the whole of all the, the different people that were around. Um, for whatever reason, I'm deciding not to spoil this one, although it really doesn't matter uh, it was it was good. I enjoyed it. Um, at this point, reading all of these short stories, it's just interesting to think about um, the whole of the work. Um, just spending time with another example of uh, Sherlock, another characterization of Sherlock. And th there was a short story where it was in third person, uh, which I felt was one of the most disarming um experiences, uh, especially reading them all uh, one after another, to have one where it's not from Sherlock, it's not from Watson, you expect it from Watson, um, is in third person, and there's one of these um, uh, preambles where Watson's telling you about how he chooses which one he's going to select, where he mentions that sometimes he writes them in the third person. As far as I know, there's only one example um, up until we're at 51 or 52 short stories. Only one example where it really is just a third-person story. And uh, this is several stories after that moment. And Watson um, gives an explanation. So it's a, um, like a retroactive 
explanation as to what was going on in that story. And the, the reason, the rationale was that um, Watson was so little involved in the affairs of that case in particular that uh, the, the best way of writing that story seemed to be re to, to remove himself altogether because he had nothing to do with it but still thought it was a worthy story to be told. I do find that interesting because I thought the third person story was a bit of a misstep. Uh, but when you read when you're reading them all, um, having a little detail like that um, does elevate at, at least my remembrance of that story, which I find pretty neat. Anyway, um, so the adventure of the lion's mane. Uh, let me know if you've read it. Andy has a lion's mane. <laughs> bothering him. So uh, let me know if you've read it. Um, thank you for watching and take care.